It's nothing to do with witnesses. Oh, the justice of the peace wasn't there. Who cares about that? The fact of the matter is, talaq is talaq. And there are three things the Prophet ﷺ said. You can't, three things that take effect even if you play in them. Marriage, divorce, and freeing a slave. That hadith in Sahih al-Jamiyah. Marriage, divorce, and freeing a slave. You're playing around and joking. You tell your wife, I love you so much. I, you're laughing and chuckling and say, I divorce you irrevocably. She's divorced irrevocably. She's got to get out. You've got to bring a U-Haul van and haul all of her stuff out. People are joking in a room about their daughter. Oh, I love you so much. And, or they're joking and saying, oh, I, I marry my daughter to you. And the daughter says, oh, laughing, I, I accept. And the other family says, I accept. They're married. They're married. They've got the person there to conduct it. And they're just joking around and playing and doing a mock marriage. They're married. This is why ulama like Sheikh Muhammad Sha'arawi and others say it's haram to act because it will involve you sometimes pronouncing talaq upon screen on wives who are not your wives or marrying wives who are not your wives who become your wives pronouncing talaq your other wife hears it sees it on television does that talaq take effect or not? This is serious. You're sitting there and you're acting on some daytime soap opera in Egypt your wife is watching television saying oh I'm going to watch my husband on television you pronounce the words of talaq, your wife hears them, and you're looking at the screen at the time, the wife is looking at you, and so your eyes, although you're not physically present, you make eye contact. Is that talaq? Some ulama that agree with Sheikh Shara said, yes it is. That's why you can't do acting, it's haram. It's serious. So, talaq and the principles that undergird it are serious. So we've entered the ayat of talaq, and so from... Our ayat here from 226 all the way unto our ayat at 237. We're talking about talaq. So for the next couple of weeks, we've got to get through this. People need to understand who are about to get married, people who are about to get divorced, or people who don't want to get divorced and want to have a stable marriage, you need to understand this so you do not befall this. This does not befall you. أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم استغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم الحمير الرحيم ولا إله إلا الله. Now I realize I've gone through a lot of information, a lot of material over a short period of time. We just began the verses of Palak, so there's a lot that still has to be fed in. Is there a question over what we've covered so far? Yes. Question is, if someone came across a Muslim brother that had said these things to his wife before, what would be our understanding and what would be our responsibility? Has the brother pronounced three talaq at once on his wife? No, I'm saying like if this happened. If this happened. If, if a Muslim brother pronounced three talaq at once upon his wife, then and, and you came to know of this, you would have to explain to him. First of all, you would investigate to find out, you know, was he forced? Did he, did he really intend this or was he made to say it? Did he say it in his sleep? If it was categorically affirmed that he said this with firm intention, that it was clearly stated and clearly made as a statement that came from him and that he meant it, then the talaq takes effect. The talaq takes effect. Okay? This is why you mustn't play with talaq. It's better that you punch the wall or go for a walk and yell at the sky and everything else. Because you pronounce the talaq, you can't get it back. It's better that you go on a walk. It's, it's, it's better that you do kick the wall or say, that's it, I'm, I'm leaving for the night or whatever else or whatever these, these Hollywood things that people say. It's better to say that than pronounce it because you can't get it back. Once it's broken, it's broken. Yes? Is there another question? Yes? Yeah, you mentioned there, Chef, that um, if you said it with the intention, hmm. uh, and obviously sometimes people do say things in anger but not intending to divorce their wife, Mm -hmm. uh, but they say they use the word and also in the ayah before it, with regard to the oaths mm -hmm. it says that, that those oaths that are made in love uh, so does that apply to talaq as well? the question is is whether the ayah regarding making oaths in love whether or not that applies to uh, talaq and whether or not that would be um, an issue when someone was making talaq looking into their intention whether they meant it or not Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, Rasulillah. The 
only school that would look into uh, intention regarding talaq and investigate are the Hanbalis. They look into what did he say, uh, what did you say? Oh, I said this. And did he say it in Arabic? Because sometimes if he says, well, I said this in our language, sometimes the Hanabi, they won't accept it because they say this is said in his vernacular and that counts for nothing in the revealed law. So you look into what did he say at the time that he said it? Was he lucid? Yes. Did he mean it and did he intend it? Yes, he did. Then you would go from there. So those ayahs could be applied, but not all the fuqaha accept that the ayah on oaths can be applied to divorce. Not all fuqaha accept that. I, I took knowledge from a Shafi'i scholar, and he said it is irrelevant what your niya was. The fact of the matter is you said what you said, and now you bear the consequences of what you said. It seems to be a bit of a coincidence, the ayah with regard to oaths is yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of discussion regarding talaq and the principles and people that forswear their wives and put them away and all these other things. And a lot of this jahiliya culture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is getting rid of. But you'll see that some Muslims may inadvertently or even purposefully, purposefully fall into it by taking part in certain actions where there'll be a man that will say well I'll get rid of my wife or I'll leave my wife alone and marry his wife then he'll fly out somewhere else or go somewhere else and leaves his wife and abandons her now that then brings up another difference of opinion if someone disappears he did not state talaq or anything before he died <coughs> What do you do in a case like that? Because it will come up in these ayat. We'll need to talk about that because there's a difference of opinion regarding that. Some of the Hanafi scholars would say that the waiting period to discern whether such a person has died or not for the wife would be for her to wait 70 years, some have stated 120 years, which means basically that she would wait indefinitely. Hanbali scholars would say that they would investigate, look into the, look into putting out search parties or reports on him. And if they receive nothing back within a certain period of time, they assume that he's dead or that he wants nothing to do with his wife and they use these ayat as a proof. And then they, they, they dissolve the marriage. Fesh. So these ayat on fesh or dissolving and other things, there's going to be a lot that's going to come up inshallah in the next few weeks. Just one final question. Come across a, a, a true account. This is a, a true case, a point in case. And uh, a young uh, woman was married um, by her mother to somebody who was a drunk. She knowingly knew that he was a drunk. And when she married him, the Uqba Nikah, there was a contract made in which the daughter was never made aware of. And basically, the contract was made. It really upset me when I heard this that the mother had actually got together with her brother and put in the contract that if she was to ask for a hula, that she would have, literally have to pay so much gold, a large amount, literally, you know, twenty thousand, thirty thousand pounds worth of gold, right, in order for her to request a hula, hmm. and it's completely unheard of that you know a, a mother of a daughter would put that in. Mm -hmm. She lost it, but she had known for a while that this guy was a drunk. Yeah. And uh, is that valid? Even though the daughter didn't know it, and I don't think the imam who actually uh, presented or conducted the nikah, because the brother was present, and he says he's ne he never knew this, right. whether he, the imam uttered these words. So if he didn't utter these words in terms of the contract, is that valid? Okay. The question is in regards to a case study in which a marriage was conducted and the daughter was married to a drunk and it was known by the family that the man was a drunk and the mother and the brother 
gathered their resources together, the mother and her brother gathered the resources together and put within the will that if she was to ever ask for khula, they would have to pay a large amount of gold in order for the khula to be satisfied, in order to keep her from breaking free of the marriage. The Imam did not mention these points in the uh, discussion that he gave when he opened the contract on the marriage, and they were not read to the sister and she was not aware of them. The Muslim sister was brought into this marriage against her will? No. Oh, willingly. Willingly. She, 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 she willingly married the, married the man, but did not know about the drunkenness. Alhamdulillah, salatu rasulillah. We have a number of things at, at work. Number one is any, if she did not consent to the condition being put within the contract, it is batil in the school of Ibn Muhammad because the woman controls the conditions. The woman controls the conditions in the nikah. So it's batil. That condition doesn't stand. Number two, if the husband is a drunk and she didn't know about it, then she comes to find that he is and she wants to break free from him, she does not have to ask for khula, she can go for fesh. Because there are defects within the marriage that were hidden like this, major sins that are impacting upon the marriage and her, that based upon this, she can seek a fesh. It doesn't have to be that she seeks a khula, it can be a fesh where they go to uh, uh, the qadi of an area or a jurist or a set of jurists or sheikhs and the marriage is dissolved and then the matter will be complete. Um, the reason why I asked for consent is because if she had not given her consent in the beginning, it would have been baltil anyway, and they just would have fornicated with it. It would have been baltil. But because she gave her consent, um, the marriage took place, but it can be dissolved. So she doesn't even have to ask for khula, and even if they try to force her with those conditions, she doesn't have to accept them. She can go straight for fesh. Is, is there a time period for fasa or does it uh, depend upon, I mean, in this case, if there are children involved? Um, Qu so after she's had so many children, mm -hmm. can she still go for fasa? The question is, the is, this question is, is after they've had children and they've been together, can the wife still go for fasa after a period of time? Um, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa yes. They can still go for fesh because it is something that was hidden. It's like, for example, the if she agreed to accept it and said, I will live with him irrespective, then she wouldn't go for fesh. But if she finally said or decided or came to firm determination that I will not live with this man any longer, then she can go for fesh and have it granted that this information was hidden from me. I was not given this information. I was not uh, up to date regarding everything I should have known for my nikah. Therefore, I, I want my freedom. But once she goes forward, then those sheikhs or that panel of sheikhs or that marja or that qadi or that faqih, he will look into the entire case. And uh, if all of the proofs are satisfied, then the talaq will be given, irrespective of whether he's there or not. He'll be informed in the mail. But the talaq will happen. Fesh is very quick. Once the fesh is in place and the process starts, it is very quick. The process between the fesh being delivered, the talaq being delivered, then it happening, then everything going into place, then her moving, and then all of these things happen so speedily, lightning fast. But as I said, there are few people in the environment that we're in that want to buck the dominant trend of the culture. Because if you did, you and I know that fasq would become almost as prevalent as nikah. If this happened, it would be very serious. Um, I'm sorry to hear about the sister's case, but uh, she definitely needs to, if she is um, in that situation, to go for fasq if, if she chooses to do that. Yes. Is there a final question? Yes. You know, regarding what you said about acting as well, and mm. uh, not to play around with the scenarios of marriage and divorce, mm. is that the basis why acting is uh, said to be haram? Or is it like the question is regarding why uh, acting is said to be haram. Is it because of the playing around or use of words and such? Is this the basis of why? Alhamdulillah.
But one thing that has to be cleared is that not all the ulama say that acting is haram. But the most vocal are those who say that it's haram. And they include Sheikh Muhammad Matwa al Sha'arawi. He's the same alimus against organ donation and such. His position regarding acting and some of the other ulama who say that acting is haram uh, is it has to do with the fact of you're making pronouncements. If you're in a movie where you're, someone is playing your wife and you address her as your wife, you talk about her as your wife, and she acquiesces in the movie and everything else, they say, well, this is, this is tantamount to nikah. You have witnesses, you have everyone there. Right? The husband's there, she becomes polyandrous because she's got two husbands now. This is haram. The other ulama, they say no, because everyone that's there knows that this is not true. To which Sheikh Sha'arawi and others say, well, then they're, they're, they're rubber stamping a lie. And it's happening in front of them and they're allowing it. So it's still haram. These ulama say, no, it's not. Because it depends on what type of acting is being done. Because it may be someone is just acting in an action film. They may be in a mystery film. It could be a whole number of things. Every single thing in acting is not necessarily haram in and of itself. So there is a big dispute about it. I would say when you meet people that hold the position that, listen... Acting is haram. They hold that position. Respect them. But the people that hold the position that acting is haram, they also have to respect the other people that say that acting is not haram. Because it's a valid khilaf and they have to accept that. Just like organ donation. The people that say, no, it's haram, it's not yours. Fine. But they have to accept the position of people that say that, no, in emergency situations, I can donate one. People that say IVF is haram. There's very few scholars that say IVF is haram. In vitro fertilization. But those that say in vitro is haram. Um, okay. But they have to respect those in the Gulf. From the Hanabi that say it's categorically valid. And in certain cases, wajib to protect family lineage. So, yes. Is, is that when the, the female can't have children? That's right. That's correct. And they use so... These type of differences of opinion and these ahkam and these rulings, one of the things that we have to learn is maturity. So when you meet people that have that position, it's up to you what position you hold. When you meet people that hold a different position to you, try not to get into argumentation. You can have a spirited discussion, alhamdulillah, because you're both passionate about what, what it is you believe. You can, but try to avoid disputation. Because it takes all of the rahmah and barakah out of a discussion. Yeah? Okay. So if that is the completion, inshallah, next week we will pick up uh, most likely from the top of the page again and go all the way through the other pages, inshallah. We may complete uh, the ayat and nikah, uh, the kitab al talaq. We might complete that next week, inshallah. <laughs> أستغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم يرحم الراحمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك مشهد من لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك ويتوب إليك إنه غفور رحيم يرحم الراحمين ولا إله إلا الله السلام عليكم